morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. I'm Sarah Verser with WBRC Fox 6 News on your side. Super excited about this opportunity to help women and families connect to resources you might not know are available to you. I'm joined by a dynamic panel of women here who are here for no other reason but to help you navigate through this pandemic, which has been disruptive. It's been ripping family members away from us. Some people are still struggling with their health trying to recover and can't work. It's been disruptive financially in almost every way that you can think of. But on the other hand, the economy is bouncing back. Job creation is up in Alabama. There are more than more jobs available than there are people to fill them. And on the other hand, some experts say the pandemic has wiped out decades, decades of gains for women who have left the workforce by the millions. In Alabama, Community Food Bank of Alabama expects to, to triple the amount of families that they will serve this year. So we know that there is a huge disconnect and I'm so grateful for my panel of women who are here. All I did was pick up the phone and call them and say, hey, I wanna help some people, will you join me? And they all said yes. So let me introduce who we have today, this morning, on our dynamic panel. Dr. LaRonda McGrath is CEO of the YWCA of Central Alabama. She has been recognized many times as a barrier breaker. And the first time I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. McGrath was interviewing her for our conversations on how uh, the pandemic was impacting women, disproportionately impacting women of color as well. We were talking about the she session. So I am so, uh, grateful that she is joining me again this morning. Also joining us, Dr. Cynthia Anthony, who is the president of Lawson State Community College, the first woman to hold that position. I'm telling you, I've got groundbreakers all over the place in this, in this uh, panel this morning. She's named, uh, Lawson State, of course, named one of the top five community colleges in the nation. One of the slogans there is start here and you can go anywhere. Also joining us this morning, Dr. Stephanie Yates. She is the chairman of the Department of Accounting and Finance at, at the Collat School of Business at UAB. Uh, I didn't realize also that she is the Senior Scientist, Minority Health and Research Center, General Clinical Research Center. She's also uh, there as well. She is an economist that you can ask her anything about this economy and she can tell you how to navigate it. So Dr. Yates, thank you so much for joining me as well. Joan Wright is the Executive Director of Child Care Resources, who has become what many have recognized as a fierce advocate for quality child care. And not just, we could stop right there, but she is also an advocate for access for everyone to have quality child care. So I'm so grateful that you are joining us as well. And Pitch hitting here for Sheila Tyson, who is a District 2 Commissioner who could not be here this morning, and I understand why, and I know that she really, really wanted to be here. Uh, she has a heart for helping people in the community, but Dr. Luanza Webb, she has left us in great hands with Dr. Luanza Webb, who is the Program Manager and Grants Administrator for Jefferson County Community Service and Workforce Development. Thank you all ladies for being here. I'm so grateful for your input. Let's start with Dr. McGloss. We talked about the she session. It is very, very real for women. You deal with women all the time. You're helping, you're serving women and families with homelessness, with uh, job training. You have a myriad of ways to serve. I want you to tell me, first of all, what you're seeing uh, with women and families and then Talk about some of the resources if you can. Thank you, Dr. McGrath. Absolutely. Thank you, Sarah, for inviting me for this very important conversation. Um, as we've discussed or talked before, the YWCA is a 118-year-old organization, and we've been at the front lines of gender equity issues um, for that time period. And today, we are at the intersection of gender and race to really address the systemic barriers to success um, for women and women of color. Um, our work is carried out through three pillars of service, and that is affordable housing, quality childcare, and domestic violence services. What we are seeing, many of the women that we serve um, are essential workers or they're in service industries. And we know that jobs in the service industry 
have been disappearing um, for years, even prior before um, COVID. And I'm sure that Dr. Yates may talk a little more about that in terms of the economy. Um, but some of our folks lost jobs. Many fell behind in their rent payments and some were without childcare. They were also um, not just caring for children, but they were caring for maybe parents and not having the adequate um, support for that to um, support them in that. Uh, victims of domestic violence found themselves um, early on in the pandemic really sheltered in place with abusers, uh, forcing them to make some very difficult decisions and, and leaving urgent decisions. And oftentimes that means losing their job, uh, needing a, you know, education in terms of child care for their children, whether that's in school or after school care. And at the height of the pandemic, we saw our calls really increase and increase substantially. In 2020, we closed the year with uh, 2,255 total calls, and we are on pace to surpass that number this year. Um, from January through November, we've had 2,218 calls, and so we still have two months to go. So we know that women are really feeling it. 66% um, of caregivers are women. And in Alabama, 52% of them are breadwinners. And so those are the women that we serve and they're really feeling it. And quite frankly, getting back to uh, normal, if you will, um, is getting back to a system that has failed women for generations. And so happy to continue that conversation. I wanna remind our viewing audience on Facebook, we are taking your questions. So please, as our, our guests are talking, form your questions. You can put them in the chat there on our Facebook page and I will direct those questions to our guests today. Dr. McGraw, can you talk about some resources that are available to people out there? Sure, we have um, at YW, we provide affordable housing to eligible individuals and families. Um, those are families with low to moderate income. And I encourage people to um, really reach out to our housing at ywcabham.org for more information there. And these are transitional and permanent housing. Um, we provide housing for older adults and people with disabilities. We also provide, um, we are the sole state certified domestic violence provider in Jefferson, Blount, and St. Clair County. So we provide a 24-hour um, shelter, emergency shelter, as well as a crisis line. And that crisis line number, I can uh, certainly give that, but it's 322-205-322-4878, or 4878 also stands for HURT. So that's domestic violence. And within domestic violence, we have advocates and legal assistance and support groups and things of that nature that women may need right now um, if this is their situation. We also offer free GED prep classes, financial literacy classes, paid workforce development programs for adults. And at the YW, we also operate a, a boutique where women in need can receive free or shop at low cost um, for new or gently used apparel. And that's important if you're going uh, for a job at now in a, a new industry maybe, and you're looking for that, um, that particular outfit that you can shop with dignity at the um, My Sister's Closet Boutique. And we have a child development program that is a nationally accredited um, child development program. And that's, we serve children ages six weeks to five years old. And the first priority there is given to families residing in our shelter or who are experiencing homelessness. When you hear people say there are jobs available and people just don't wanna work, what is your response to that? That one really bothers me. <laughs> I'll just say that. I think people do wanna work. I think we need to work on paying people more. Um, we have a persistent gender wage gap issue. I believe that we have not prepared many of our girls and women for careers that are um, careers that are not just for them to get by, but ones where they can um, survive and thrive. And so that's on us as a system. It's a systems issue and we all have to work on that. So no, there are jobs there, but do the jobs um, provide family leave and the things that they need in order to help take care of families? I just talked about how many women 
are the primary caregivers, but are we supporting them in their roles as the primary caregiver at work, family medical leave, maternity leave, and those sorts of things. Um, so yes, let's work on the system. It's broken. There are disappearing sector jobs, uh, woefully inadequate social and economic policies, and just far too few women and girls in the pipeline for high paying jobs. So we need those apprenticeships. We need girls in STEM, STEM programming, and we need to make that investment so that they can go after any job they want. And one last thing for you in terms of, before we turn it over to uh, some of other, other speakers and get to take questions from our audience, is what do employers need to do to make the workforce easier for women to re-enter? to re-enter, create welcoming environments. Um, and I'm going to say something that really sounds very basic, but listen to women. Because quite frankly, women have been saying what they need, um, but no, no one, it takes a pandemic for people to finally like listen, listen to women, they know what they need. And so that's a, a huge um, big um, adjustment there that we can all make. And creating serious policy reform. We need robust paid maternity leave, paid family leave, and medical benefits. Those are going to be the things that really help women thrive. Um, establishing those work environments where women not only feel included, but they feel safe, welcomed, and empowered in those environments. And I also want to say the domestic violence that you talked about crosses all kinds of socioeconomic lines. I was very surprised when a woman came to me and told me, listen, I need help. Um, I need help, I need counseling. And then there were no counselors available. They were all booked up. So that is another area. I know that you offer those kinds of services as well. We absolutely do. And I encourage um, anyone to call our 24 hour crisis line. We will, um, that's again, 205-322-4878. Our staff are phenomenal. They will work with them um, if it's safety planning that they need. Um, we can work with them on if they need counseling, whatever it is, the resources. And if we don't provide it, we will make a referral to other services in the community, our other community partners. Dr. Cynthia Anthony, uh, the president of Lawson State Community College, I wanna ask you now to join this conversation and talk about what you're seeing in terms of women and serving women and I know that you guys there at Dawson State have a number of different workforce development opportunities. Can you talk about that for a moment? Certainly, certainly. Let me say good morning to everyone and thank you for engaging us in this powerful conversation this morning. Um, you know, at, at Lawson State, we do thrive on our mantra of it's all here and start here, go anywhere. Um, we recognize that education and training is not a one size fits all uh, model. And thus we strive to provide our educational and training opportunities that fit the needs of, of those students, particularly the, the females, the women that we are talking about here today and that we are trying to, to serve. We certainly have campuses. We have two campuses, Bessemer Campus and Birmingham Campus, which actually provides for um, expanded training opportunities across our service area in the Birmingham metropolitan area. So as we look at uh, workforce opportunities and those um, educational and training experiences that actually prepare females to get into the workforce. We understand that we have to um, look at not only our college transfer programs that are very, very popular, but we have to look at career and technical education programs that prepare uh, individuals to go directly into the workforce. We have to look at our adult education and our um, um, career program or career pathway opportunities because we do have a number of females who may not have um, the educational background and the credentials to get into some of these um, high paying, high wage, living wage jobs that my colleague just talked about. So we want to make sure we provide those training opportunities through them. If they need a GED, um, if they are looking um, for a, an alternate high school diploma, we provide those opportunities for these, these women also. And then given 
the um, economic situation and given the, the demand of the workforce right now, we have truly become more focused on short-term training opportunities that get these individuals into the workforce uh, without going through you know, a two-year program or, or even a one-year program in many cases. Um, we have done the research. We know what the labor market says, where the jobs are. So uh, we have actually focused on quite a bit of our non-credit training that does not stifle um, our, our prospective students in going through a full admissions process and all of that. So they can get training in um, logistics or medication aid or phlebotomy or uh, nursing assistance, some of those short-term training programs that we partner with um, colleagues that we have here on, on the screen today in order to in, ensure that we're providing those wraparound services that women who are trying to get into the workforce really need in order to be successful. Um, we, we've talked about STEM and we've talked about um, the high wage, high demand jobs. Uh, Lawson has a STEM center of excellence so that we can get females um, even at an early age with some of our programs that we take into the high schools and into the community, whether it's Apple or coding or just STEM in general, so that we can begin that pipeline and we get out of hopefully the situation that we're in now with women being prepared for these types of jobs. We really believe in um, uh, equipping, engaging, and empowering our students for success. And that's what we do with, with the women that we serve. We equip them to go out and to be successful. We empower them to have their voice and to make known what their needs are and how they can be successful. And then we engage them in helping to make sure they have what they need to, to be successful. So I'll talk just for a moment um, about just the general uh, programs. And everyone knows that we are uh, a proud HBCU or uh, a historically black um, community college and HBCC. So we have a very diverse student population that comes to us. Uh, and it is important that we recognize uh, the needs of those students that we have coming to us. We, we have a robust uh, group of people who are willing and able to help them through the admissions process if that's what they are looking for. Certainly in the way of resources for our more traditional uh, women coming into college is the federal financial aid. Um, one of the things that has been on the national uh, landscape is about loans and about the, the, the high numbers of loans and the amounts that students leave school owing. Lawson State does not participate in a loan program. We strive to find other forms of financial aid through federal Pell grants and supplemental grants and, and emergency type loans so that what students get when they're at Lawson State does not have to be paid back. Thus, they don't leave us with a, with a financial burden when, when they um, complete our programs. But certainly through the traditional federal financial aid means, we're able to provide those resources to help students cover the cost of, of their education. Uh, we have been quite fortunate as an HBCU, as well as with just the pandemic and the care Act funding that we're able to provide support, uh, technology support and, and other kinds of student success support measures for our students who are being adversely impacted uh, by the pandemic. So we, we are very pleased with that emergency funds that can be used sometimes for child care or for transportation or, um, you know, extra, extra academic needs that, that students may have. Um, it's all about partnerships. It's about access and success. You know, there are often times that we have all these access points and we can get students into training programs, but what about the success part of it? So we operate in both the access and success mo modalities. Uh, as far as the access part, we have um, always had, or for many, many years, had different modalities of, of learning for our students. The pandemic has caused us to expand those. So we now provide um, our regular on-campus classes. We have hybrid classes, distance ed and online classes. So these women who are dealing with just the life, the transportation issues, the childcare issues, 
Um, you know, we have attempted to remove some of those barriers that they have by providing the modalities and the class scheduling that will allow them to make this fit into their schedule so that they can be successful and get back into the workforce. You just removed a tremendous burden from a lot of people when you talked about affording this training. There are a lot of people who are evaluating or reevaluating their lives. They want to do something different, and you're providing an avenue. Yes, we, we, we certainly do. And we, we have looked at it and we know uh, because we're already seeing women who are coming back to school and saying, I want to do something different. Um, I want to encourage our, our um, audience, our listeners to really think about perhaps some of those non-traditional uh, careers Women in those non non traditional careers can certainly succeed. They can earn um, a very good living wage for their families. I, I have a student who um, we just did a segment on who completed one of our first. Uh, she was in our inaugural class with the Mercedes uh, Technology Program, and she has. Um, a phenomenal career at Mercedes. She was only female in that particular program. So I wanna encourage our females to see themselves outside of the normal box that we are so often put into and explore STEM opportunities, explore opportunities in non-traditional areas. I have a female instructor in our welding program. So we are drawing more and more students into, or females into that particular area. Our work-based learning opportunities, and as Dr. Um, McGross talked about, um, apprenticeships, all of those things help people to see that they can be successful and that we are paving the way and creating well-defined pathways into the world of work so that they can be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anthony. Dr. Yates, how did we get here? Food prices are through the roof, gas prices are all going up, and there has been a revolution for a number of, of, of um, employers who are demanding higher pay, they're demanding different um, um, hours. So how did we get here and what are you seeing in terms of women? Well, it's almost as if we're seeing a perfect storm. You know, I, I, I talk, I, I feel like I, I say the same things over and over, but this one is a little bit different in that, you know, this is a supply and demand issue, but, but with a twist, you know, so um, we obviously had this incredible experience with COVID that we're, we're still going through. And so, Every, so everything was shut down for a while. And so our, our employers were having to shut down. We're, we're losing jobs. Um, but then what we didn't expect was what we're seeing in the recovery. And so, so everything, obviously, none of this we expected to begin with. But we had all this, this retrenching and pullback on the supply side because we were shut down for so many months. But then as we started to reopen, the recovery has been stronger and faster than expected. And I guess some of that is good, but the good is a little bit too good or it, it's happening in a way that we're not able to keep up with as an economy. And so what's happening is with the stimulus, we've got all of this money going into the economy with people retooling, you know, they're, they're going to Lawson and they're saying, hey, I want to do this instead of this. And they're, they're um, heeding the words of Dr. McGrath and saying, you know, listen to me, I know what I want. And so this is what's best for my family. And so we're, we're having the luxury to make choices for what's best for us and our families. And so what happens then is that We've got this labor shortage, which is which is exacerbating the supply issues, but we still want what we want. And we've got this money in the economy. We're demanding these new jobs, these better jobs, these higher wages. Employers are having to respond to that. And so that, that um, increases the demand and increases the problem. And so what, so the result is these higher prices, you know, we're seeing increases of like 6% and it oftentimes 
we're able to respond to higher prices because we just cut back. You know, we say, I I'm not going to buy that new car this year. Or I'm going to hold back on that remodeling project. You know, remember back in the spring, um, we were seeing the higher prices in lumber and building materials. And so we said, okay, now's not the right time to remodel my kitchen. So I'm going to wait on that. But now it's a little bit different because it's trickling down to everything. You know, we're seeing uh, grocery prices increase. We're seeing gas prices increase. And so we're, we're seeing an increase in our everyday expenses. And so when you go back to your question and how, what does this mean for women? Well, we're the ones that manage the budget, right? You know, as we, we've mentioned a couple of times already, we're the caregivers or the caretakers. In fact, I was having this exact conversation with my husband this morning. You know, we're the ones who, who take care of the family. We're the ones who figure it out. And consequently, you know, when it comes to financial literacy, financial education, um, it also means that we're so focused on the day-to-day -day as women that we're not spending enough time thinking, you know, being forward-looking, thinking about what does that mean for us in terms of retirement, in terms of investments, in terms of all of these things that we need to do to manage our own financial futures. And so um, when, you, when you put that background, that, that's just the story for women, regardless of what's going on in the economy. When you take that background and that baggage, so to speak, and add it to this perfect storm, as I mentioned, where we've got higher prices and women are at a disadvantage because we make less money, we oftentimes, for, for no fault of our own, have fewer opportunities, and we have less access to resources and education um, we're, we, we have fantastic partners like the YW that's making those resources available, but, but for various reasons, it's just different for women. And, and so what all of this means, that what's happening in the economy with the higher prices is that we're at even greater disadvantage. And what's funny to me, and I don't really mean funny in a good way, but funny meaning interesting, is that when you read the financial press, once again, uh, the economists are looking to women to solve the problems. And so what, am I, what do I mean by that? One of the problems that, that's, that's um, kind of fueling the fire that we're seeing right now with higher prices and this, this supply and demand issue is the labor shortage. And so what a lot of economists are saying is that, well, if we could get women to get back to work and rejoin the workforce and, and, and come back in greater numbers, that, that's going to solve the problem or we will start to see inflation recede when women go back to work. So, you know, yet again, it's, 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 it's our fault or at least our problem to solve. But I think that it's a little bit more complicated than that. We've already heard the programs and the opportunities that are available for women
we've already heard that that historically um, we've had other entities, other groups um, possibly imposing upon women what's best for them when really women are in the driver's seat. And so I think we're, what we're starting to see is a shift of women taking advantage of that position in the driver's seat, taking advantage of the resources, taking advantage of the opportunities, because we, we have um, more resources in our economy, um, a little bit, women are a little bit actually better positioned now than ever to reassert themselves and, and um, not necessarily save the economy, but save their own families. Some women are positioning themselves to start their own businesses. How do you do yes. that? What, what, what do you have to have? What's available for women to help? And I know Dr. Webb will have some information on that too, but what is available for women to get in the driver's seat and start their own business? Well, you know, I think this is a great time. I think, but I think women and we, you know, we have so many great resources on the panel. It's a great time to start your own business. It's a great time to rethink your, your place, your contribution, what you really want as a woman. But now more than ever, you have to think strategically about it because we're seeing a shift in, you, you know, as I mentioned, supply and demand, but we're, we're seeing a shift. I, I, I think the new normal, whatever that is, isn't going to be the same as what we had before. You know, so we have learned through this pandemic that uh, we don't have to be in the office nine to five. We can have a fantastic panel of women solving the world's problems from all of our respective workplaces and, 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 and work sites. We, we can do things differently and maybe even better than we did before. So when, when women or anyone is thinking about what type of business do I start? How do, I, how do I take advantage of what we're seeing in the economy right now? You really have to be forward looking and think about, well, what have we learned from the last 24 months? And how much of what we've learned is going to persist into the new economy? And how much is going to return? You know, um, in all of this shifting, you know, you, we've all seen the reports of the number of people who are quitting their jobs um, for, for various reasons, and I won't get into all of that, but um, what does that mean in terms of new businesses? Are, are, are some of those jobs going to go away? Are some of those jobs going to be replaced by technology or by um, a, a different, different working arrangements, different, a different working environment? And so I think there's so much opportunity there um, for women especially to swoop in and figure out how to solve some of these supply chain problems, some of these labor shortage problems, um, and, and then do it in a very thoughtful manner. Because when you think about this notion that women are supposed to come in and save the economy, if a, if a woman-owned business can address the issues that women have in terms of work-life balance while also delivering a, a product that is much needed, then I think that's the secret sauce. And I think there are a lot of really smart women who can take advantage of what we're seeing by just looking around and thinking strategically about where are the gaps what do I have to offer? How can I fill that in? And then how can I take advantage of all of these fantastic resources that are out there in terms of workforce training, uh, workforce development, uh, childcare opportunities, grants that are available, financing through, you know, through the different government programs that, and I, I think also there are some pretty solid resources to hold someone's hand to walk them through the process. Dr. Yates, thank you so much. Um, Joan Wright is with Child Care Resources and we hear over and over again that child care is a major, major obstacle for women right now in, in terms of re-entering the job force. 
talk about that for a moment and, and what you're seeing in terms of changes in childcare. Certainly, Sarah, thank you. It's great to be here with all these fabulous people. And um, thank you for setting us up to help women in our communities and beyond because this is virtual. So we have people that could be watching us from literally anywhere. So we hope this is speaking to you and inspiring and encouraging you to take those next steps that can better yourself, better your family, better your situation. So that's what we're here about today is to share real stories, real information that you can grasp, that you can take advantage of to help you in your situation. With regards to child care, I would uh, purport that child care has been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. And let me talk about that for a little bit. Child care was one of those um, areas that was completely shut down for several months when the pandemic first hit. Those facilities that were able to remain open were only serving essential workers at the time. And they still had to take lots of different measures to ensure health and safety of children in their care and their own health and safety of their staff, many of whom left the workforce because of fears of catching the virus themselves because of their exposure to so many people with close proximity. It's difficult to care for a child in a six foot distance. It's difficult to care for a child with a mask on all the time when children actually respond to and need facial expressions. They need to be able to um, develop the, those um, feelings and that feedback through facial expressions. So for those reasons, um, childcare was disproportionately affected and for many others. As childcare slowly reopened, childcare providers had to be very creative, innovative in how they could message to families we are here for you. We have safety and health at topmost of our operations with regards to extra cleaning and sanitization with ways we're managing children playing with each other and playing with toys. They had to also convey that to staff so that staff would return. Unlike some industries, childcare that is licensed in Alabama has ratio requirements and you can't serve children without appropriate supervision. So if staff, enough staff are not there, the facility can't serve children safely and within ratio. So that affects women, particularly women who are working and have young children. Where am I gonna take my child? Many childcare programs were offering reduced hours so they could do the extra cleaning and management of their facilities needed on the front and back end of the day. Uh, many uh, of them had to reduce their ratios, again, because of staffing challenges and to help create space for their children in their care. So it, it did create a lot of challenges and continues to create a lot of challenges. Uh, I was looking at some data um, several months ago, and while some child care has re, a lot of child care has reopened, um, DHR will share with you that about 90%, 90-95% of child care is reopened. However, what you're not seeing is about 20% of child care is gone in Alabama. 20% of child care disappeared from operations and most of these were women owned businesses and the majority of them were women owned businesses from women of color. And so they're being affected too by the changes in um, what their industry is, childcare, because their work literally disappeared almost overnight. And it's very difficult. I know many childcare providers who talk to us at Child Care Resources on a daily basis, help me find staff help me figure out how do we advocate for what, what several of these professional women have said today, higher wages. Childcare is one of the lowest paid industries. Most people that work in childcare are barely making above minimum wage and many of them qualify for financial assistance themselves because of their low wage earning. Yet research tells us and many families expect that is the most critical time of child development and we need quality child care providers nurturing and supporting healthy child development. Yet we're going to pay them abysmal rates and talk about benefits. What benefits? There are little to no benefits available to people working in child care. So it's a very challenging environment. You're working for young children. You're developing them for the most important phase of their life. And yet there's very little appreciation for them. So I want to talk about solutions today too. So uh, if you'd like, I can share some of that or I'll be happy to take another question. Okay, so some solutions. 
are, first of all, look into your local community colleges. Can you do something that will elevate your education in child care? I'm going to speak just about child care right now. Could you pursue a child development associate credential, often called a CDA? We even have that opportunity available in some of our high schools now. So a, a person, a young person could graduate from high school. And now that DHR has modified some of their licensing requirement, DHR is our Alabama Department of Human Resources, which is the licensing agent for child care in Alabama. They, they now have uh, made the entry age level at 18. So conceivably, a person could graduate from high school by completing their CDA either through a program at their high school or they can do um, dual enrollment at their local community college and also achieve that. And they could be ready to go into the workforce right away after high school. And from there, they can continue to accelerate their academic achievement and they could find themselves you know, years down the road with a bachelor's degree in child development where they could then have a higher wage uh, job in childcare or in first class pre-K. Alabama has one of the top ranked, in fact, only North Carolina and Alabama have consecutively for over, I think, 15 years now, that's more consecutive than some major university in our state with national rankings. They have a national number one ranking for high quality childcare. And those teachers in first class pre-K, whether it's in a childcare setting, a school-based setting, or a community setting, they're required to be paid at the wage of a K-12 public educator. And so that is elevated above what a child care uh, teacher would make on, on just basic child care payments. So they could find themselves um, being eligible for that higher wage by increasing their education. Um, secondly, we talked about you know, innovative and starting a business. I just share with you that child care overall, while mo most of it is open in Alabama, we're still missing a lot of child care, particularly home child care providers, which during the pandemic, we found that many families were more comfortable using a home provider, which only cares for six, up to six children, or 12 if it's a group home provider. And they are also licensed by the state of Alabama, DHR. And many families felt more comfortable in that little bit more controlled, smaller environment, because those families are generally over and over coming to that same provider. They, they keep their children there for years. And so now we're needing more home child care providers. And right now with many, primarily women, as we've talked about today, having to be at home or leaving the workforce because they need to be at home to help tend to children who are either not in school or they're attending virtually or they're having to care for other family members and work is not flexible for them to where they're not able to work from home and not have to be in the office all the time. Here's an opportunity to maximize what you're already doing um, to become a home child care provider. And there are resources available to help you with that um, through Department of Human Resources, through other resources. Uh, another solution or at least opportunity I'll share is Alabama Department of Human Resources has also been very innovative in what they're doing with the American Rescue Plan Act dollars that have come into DHR to um, help support programs across our state, across many different areas. One of them is child care. And I'm very pleased that they have said, yes, we recognize child care is struggling. So we're going to do a couple of different things. One, they have revamped and revised their quality rating and improvement system, which is a five-star rating system, much like you would expect from a restaurant or a hotel or even a movie for that matter. And they're bringing that back with increased, significantly increased monetary incentives for child care providers, both home providers and center providers. So just one example of that, if you are just a licensed child care center with a capacity of up to 50 children, licensed capacity, if you are just doing that, you're considered a star one rated program. And for that, you get a once a year, as long as you maintain your credentials and your standards, once a year, you will get a $9,000 payment for your child care program. That can help significantly to help incentivize staff to stay at work or at least return to work. Also, after the first of the year, DHR is making available quarterly bonuses to child care workers to the tune of around $1,500 a quarter. That's an additional $6,000 a year 
that if someone is in the child care workforce or enters the child care workforce and stays in it working full time, they will get quarterly bonuses through their provider. And that again is DHR's use of those ARPA funds, American Rescue Plan Act funds. So I'll just pause there for a moment and see if there's additional questions or anything you want me to elaborate. Hi, thank you. Um, I know that you guys provide training for people. There's a difference between having a paid babysitter and quality childcare. Early childhood development, I think all women really want that for their children. All childcare facilities are not, are not equal. Is there funding available for people to afford the best childcare? Well, let me talk about that a couple of different ways. Yes, uh, child care resources here in Central Alabama, we serve Blunt, Jefferson, Shelby, and Walker counties. And thank you to many of our listening audience, as well as our partner um, panelists here today that contribute to United Way of Central Alabama, because that is one of the main sources of funds that enables us to offset a portion of child care costs for eligible working families. So we're, we're picking up um, uh, assistance for child care costs for those families who earn too much to qualify for subsidies. So these are gonna be, uh, and again, it's mostly women. 100% of our families on financial assistance right now are single parent families. Majority of them are women, majority of them are women of color. And we are able, again, through the generosity of the community, we're the only entity in the state and maybe one of only a few across the country that can offset childcare costs for eligible working families. And when we analyze the sectors where those families work that are receiving assistance in the Birmingham area, they primarily work in the healthcare sector or the banking and finance sector. And so these are many of the people that you rely on every day for services, um, whether they be a nurse, a technician, a bank teller, or even a bank manager, you're relying on them and they need quality affordable childcare to be able to provide the goods and services you're expecting every day. And we're able to offset a portion of their costs. They can go to our website to complete an application. And it usually takes about a month or two to complete the qualification process. And then we can offset a portion of your costs upwards to around 50% of your costs. I do wanna mention that DHR did recently adjust their income guidelines. They increased their income guidelines to allow more families to qualify for financial assistance through childcare subsidy. And there's a different agency that monitors that and, and manages those applications. That's Child Care Central. And you can reach out to them to fill out that application process. And not only did they increase the income scale to make more families eligible for financial assistance, at least to the end of December, they're paying upwards to 100% of parent fees. So that would mean a person, if they qualify, may have no fees for childcare at least to the end of this calendar year. So I, I really encourage those of you that are listening today, if you think you may qualify or you need financial assistance to afford childcare, call us at Child Care Resources. If you don't meet our qualifications, we will direct you to Child Care Central and give you their contact information. If you wanna become a child care provider, as I mentioned earlier, most of our trainings are free just like Dr. Anthony said, our staff have been innovative in making our trainings more accessible for those that would like to take them. Most of them are available online. Several are available on demand, which means you can set aside time in your schedule to take the courses as it fits your availability. And again, most of it is free and you can do it from the comfort of your own home or the local library or wherever you can um, access the internet and have a device that can connect. And uh, you just register through our website to take those trainings to help make sure you are delivering quality child care that families are looking for. Thank you so much. Dr. Lawanza Webb, thank you for your patience. We want to find out from the government standpoint, what is available? What are those resources that are available? For example, the American Family, the American uh, Rescue Plan, forgive me, uh, provided money for rental assistance, for utility payments, and we're hearing that a lot of that money has not even been utilized. So talk about some of those resources that are available to people and what you're seeing in terms of, of benefits to women and families. Good morning, everybody. Um, some resources that are available here in Jefferson County as well as 
Shelby, St. Clair, Blunt, Chilton, um, Jasper area. We serve region four. We offer training for um, anybody pretty much that wants training, women, anybody, but we're seeing more women coming through our doors now um, wanted to change career fields um, due to lack of money. Um, wanted, they, they, they just can't um, seem to make ends meet anymore. So um, as far as training, we're seeing more women going into non-traditional training such as truck driving. And I think it was Dr. Anthony that said welding. Um, we also partner with Lawson State as, um, as well as other community colleges in the area. Um, right now, we're, we're really not seeing um, women coming in not wanting to um, better themselves. Um, we're, we're seeing more women coming in wanting to um, be, get paid higher wages um, because for us, women are always paid a lower wage, a lower wage than men. So that I think that's why a lot of them are going to non-traditional employment such as um, truck driving and as far as um, welding. Um, it's a big boom for those. Um, I'm not sure about the other funds that you spoke of because I only do workforce training, workforce development training, where we train individuals with barriers to employment. So those barriers are mainly childcare, transportation, um, barriers, they, they have healthcare barriers uh, because they don't have insurance. So for us, we try to eliminate those barriers um, for through training and non-traditional employment, through training um, healthcare fields, um, anything that will get our women from here to there. And this is not just women, it's, 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 men, it's men as well, but pretty much in our location, it's, it's um, women of color that come through our doors. Um, Childcare, we were able to provide those funds um, through the PP, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, Sarah, you'll have to tell me again what, what you're calling it. The American Rescue Plan. The American Rescue Plan. We received some funding um, through the American Rescue Plan, not a lot for our area because this, the government was saying that unemployment was still pretty low, even though we don't see that in our area. So we didn't receive a lot of funding, but the funding that we did receive, we ended up spending it all. Um, currently, um, we're at a deficit because so many people came through our doors when the pandemic hit. So we trained, I'm going to say, between five and 600 um, women coming through our door in non-traditional employment, which was the first for us. Um, we have never had um, this big influx of women coming through the door, but an issue that they were having was with childcare. So our organization, um, we teamed up and found some funding where we could do what was called supportive services for those ladies. We paid for healthcare, we paid for childcare, we paid for transportation, anything that would help them get from the place that they were in to a better situation. Um, when the pandemic really hit, all of that changed again. So more women had to either quit school, quit, quit their job. But the good thing, um, our two-year schools and a lot of our private schools, they decided to go virtual. So our women were able to still attend school, but virtually. Some schools even offered um, to give them computers. Um, they, would, they were able to come into their centers on an as-need basis. Um, I think Lawson State had a computer lab where their women could come in and, or, or their sorry, students could come in and work virtually, but it was um, on an as-needed basic limited space due to COVID. So with the childcare issue, it was major for us. Childcare um, partners that we had previously all closed down, um, as Dr. Wright has stated. So these women were put in a worse situation by not having childcare. Transportation has always been an issue for us um, in this area with our bus systems um, running the way that they do. And a lot of women just don't have vehicles 
or if they have the vehicles, they're not able to, um, to keep up the upkeep of them, gas and all of that. So our supportive services were able to help with those issues, put tires on their cars, um, help with um, if, if their car broke down and it wasn't something that was truly major where they needed to get another car, we could help them do that. And we also, you know, pay for um, a weekly stipend, gave them a weekly stipend as well um, in supportive services just to help them get through um, school when they were in school. And that could be for a number of things they could use that money for as well. So those were some of the um, things that I saw that we saw in our area. So when you hear people say that people don't want to work, what is your reaction to that? That is ludicrous. Um, people coming through our office, they do want to work. They just want to be paid a fair wage. Nobody wants to, you know, work 40, 50 hours a week in minimum wage and you're barely making it. Um, and usually in those minimum wage jobs, they may offer um, health care benefits, but they can't afford them. So, you know, they opt not to um, have insurance, which is really needed. So they don't have the benefits that they need. So I, I, I just think that's, that's really ludicrous because I know that, you know, people want to work. They just want to be paid fairly and they want to be in a, in a position where um, I think it was Dr. Yates, said it, I'm sorry, Dr. Margaret said that um, they want to be in an environment where it's inclusive. Um, and, and inviting for women. And a lot of, of those environments are not, you know, and especially with the wage gap. Dr. McGrath, for a moment, will you please just talk about the disproportionate impact on women of color and what you've seen? Well, certainly, I think um, when we talk about disproportionately, many women of color um, because of systemic racism are in fields where they are frontline workers or they are in these service industries. And therefore they were um, really bore the brunt of a lot of the um, job loss. And so that's what we're, we're seeing. And everything that we've mentioned in terms of um, lacking access and the persistent wage gap, the uh, women collectively are 82 cents to a man's $1. Um, women of color, uh, that's even less. I mean, it's, it's abysmal. And so I think that um, when you're talking about them losing their jobs, it, it is it really impacts um, everything that um, from their their families. And it's just a trickle. It's, it's almost like a um, ripple effect. Everything it impacts every single part of their lives. And so the um, that's what we're seeing. And that's what we have seen. And we are also, as Dr. Webb mentioned, provide supportive services. And that means that we wrap you know, services all around that family and um, to make sure that they are whole and, and successful in what they want to do. Dr. Anthony, if people really wanna get involved and make that step, what do they need to do? Um, they can start by just contacting our, our college, uh, go to the website, see what is available, what you're actually interested in. If you don't know, we actually have a very robust career services and college transfer area where we can actually help you to assess your skills, your abilities, your desires, and, and help, um, uh, help you make some decisions as far as those career uh, choices. Uh, certainly, if you if if we have individuals interested in going through our traditional programs, they will contact our admissions office and start the admissions process, or go to our website at uh, www.lawsonstate.edu, um, click on the admission link, start the application process, then and almost immediately you will begin getting communications and directives from the college. If um, individuals are interested in non credit training, the more um, non-traditional training through our career, our um, corporate services or workforce development division. Uh, they can certainly do that. There's an interest tab on our website and um, someone will get in touch with them immediately once they identify the area that they're interested in. Again, if they don't know, 
come visit the campus or call one of our uh, career services or our student services specialist and we can help you to find um, the best place for, for you uh, and, and increase that access and success among these women that we so um, vitally need to, to serve. Dr. Webb, how do people contact your office if they need to get access to some of those um, resources that you were talking about? They can go to mycapt, that's M-Y-C-A-P-T-E dot org. And the um, information for Jefferson County and the other regions, other areas that we serve is located on that website. And Dr. McGloss, quickly, um, the YWCA has so many resources on your website as well. Yes, we do. YWCABHAM.org. And if all else fails, you can call us at 205-322-9922. Child Care Resources, Joan Wright, quickly tell people that your website has a, a great number of resources on there as well. Yes, definitely. We have information segmented for families, providers, community. You can access our training calendar there. You can access our financial assistance application there, our guide to choosing quality child care. Our website is, of course, three W's dot C C R hyphen B H M dot org. Or you can call our office at 205 945 0 we are also now a Head Start provider for Early Head Start and Head Start in Jefferson County. Thank you. I want to thank everyone on the panel today. And for those of you who are watching, this is us saying we see you, we hear you, we know you're still struggling. And if we can help you, reach out to us. And again, thank you. We are moving forward. We're going to bring you along with us. And so all my panel members, sincere thank you for joining us. You didn't get anything out of this, but only the opportunity to help somebody. So I want to say sincere thank you to all of you for joining me today. And I, I know that we've helped a lot of people. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you, Sarah. Have a good day. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you.